Let me ask you to open your Bibles in the Old Testament to two places. Daniel chapter 12 and Jeremiah chapter 30. Daniel 12 and Jeremiah 30. I'll give you a few moments to find those two places. Daniel chapter 12 and Jeremiah chapter 30. First of all, notice in Daniel 12, verse 1, we read, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now run over to Jeremiah 30, and I'll call your attention to one verse there, and that's verse 7. And the prophet writes, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The Word of God tells about a uh, coming time of great world tribulation and persecution of the Jewish people beyond anything ever seen in history before now. The Lord Jesus foretold also of this time in Matthew 24 and verse 21, he said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You know, more space is actually devoted to preparing the world to, for the tribulation in the Old Testament than there are verses dedicated to the coming of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't... Uh, don't realize that, that that's the case, but it, it's nevertheless true. And every New Testament writer uh, refers to that coming time somewhere in his books. And Christ said in John 16, verse 33, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, the great hour of tribulation should not be confused with the tribulations of the hour. Think of it that way. You know, you lose your temper, you can't find your car keys, you get sick, and any number of those things. Those are the day-to-day -day problems that everybody deals with. That's, those aren't the tribulations that we're considering right now. But uh, the coming time of tribulation on the earth will involve every man, woman, and child throughout the world. Satan will try to make one last stand against God, against the power of God, uh, by turning the world's uh, hearts uh, against God to worship him by his proxy. And this is the man we call the Antichrist. And he will t attempt to do these things by that one who will literally be Satan in human form. The Antichrist is the, the mirror opposite of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Christ said he came, uh, quote, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, verse 28. But the Antichrist is said to magnify himself above all, Daniel 11, verse 37. Uh, in Acts 10, 38, it states how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. But the Antichrist is also called the man of sin. How would you like that to be the description of your very existence? The man of sin. And uh, the Antichrist is referred to as the destroyer. Psalm 17, verse 4. The Bible says that all bear Christ witness, quote, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, Luke 4, verse 22, when he was in the synagogue. And uh, the Bible says about him who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. But the uh, man of sin, it says he opens his mouth, quote, in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven, Revelation 13, 
verse 6. He curses everything. While, while the, the, the tribulation uh, unfolds and takes place here on the earth, you and I at that time will be in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb, getting to know as the bride of Christ, the glorified bride of Christ, getting to know our Savior, our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. That's where you and I will be. And so when he blasphemes and curses everything in heaven, those that are in heaven, he's cursing you. He's cursing me when that time comes. But the Lord Jesus is, uh, he was prefigured, he was alluded to throughout the scriptures by many different titles. He's called the Rose of Sharon. He's called the Lily of the Valley. He's called the Bright and Morning Star. He's called Wonderful. He's called Counselor. He's called the Prince of Peace throughout the Bible. The Antichrist similarly was alluded to throughout the scriptures by numerous titles as well. He is called the Man of the Earth, Psalm 10, 18. He's called the Oppressor, Psalm 72, verse 4. He's called the Adversary, Psalm 74, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Satan is your adversary. So you put those two together and you get a pretty good picture that the Antichrist will be Satan in human form. Do I understand how that can take place? Absolutely not. He, he took upon him the form of a serpent in the garden, a serpent that could talk to the woman and tempt her to sin against God. And he's, the Bible says he's transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He can be very deceptive and take on many different guises to fool people into worshiping him and thinking that they're worshiping God. This goes on with cults all the time. But he's called the evil man, Psalm 140, verse 1. He's called the spoiler, Isaiah 16, verse 4. He's called the violent man, Psalm 18, 48. He's called the unrighteous and cruel man, Psalm 71, verse 4. He's called the son of wickedness, Psalm 89, verse 22, and, and numerous other titles. All nature is drawn upon to describe the, the, uh, the scope of the tribulation and the devastation coming upon the world. We read about smoke and fire, great heat, lightning, darkness, beasts, falling stars, earthquakes. There are voices coming from heaven, trumpets, thrones, great armies, great battles, blood, plagues, scenes of judgment. Sounds like a, a rock concert in some places, right? Um, and the supernatural bursts in upon the natural world, unlike anything that's ever been seen before it. And, uh, you know, you wake up day after day and you don't expect the, the moon to be darkened or the sun to be darkened, the moon to look like be turned into blood. You don't expect stars to be falling to the earth. You don't expect all of these great things and devastating signs the book of Revelation describes. And uh, that's why it's going to be so... Um, outstanding and, and fantastic, when it occurs, the world will be just in a, in a fog, not knowing what to do or where to turn. But there are angels and devils. The bottomless pit is said to be open, and terrifying signs that then become visible. Fearful announcements are made out of the sky and the bottomless pit. There said there'd be creatures that come up out of that pit to torment men and sting men like scorpions. Um, and in this time, Satan will face off against God in one last stand, one last contest to corrupt the hearts and the souls and the minds of men left behind on the earth. But fortunately, uh, our God is bigger than Satan. Our God is greater than any other deity ever worshipped by any other unsaved, unbelieving man or woman. Um, the one who spoke and all of reality came into existence. There's, there's, 
there's no way to measure the scope of God's power. When you consider how vast the visible universe is, and to think that God is present throughout it, he knows everything going on, and yet he's not part of it, he's outside of it because he made it. It's, it's impossible for the, the human mind to wrap its, itself around the scope and the magnitude, the infinite uh, power of the God of the Bible. The gods of all other faiths, all other religions are puny and, and powerless alongside the real God of the scriptures. But uh, God will be able to pour out judgment and affliction upon men who decide they'd rather worship uh, the Antichrist, the devil, uh, and he'll display his power in all things. Isaiah, think about that. Um, God says, I am the Lord God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness in heaven and earth and so forth. I, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. The world will do both of those things. They will worship a man and pretend that he's God. And then they will make an image to that man and bow down and worship him uh, vicariously or by proxy with that image. The very first two things God said not to do is what the world's going to do. And the Bible says God is a jealous God. He wants worship only for himself and of himself because he's the only one worthy of worship. You know, worship, Dr. Gene Scott used to point this out. I'm not a big fan of Dr. Gene Scott, but he was a very intelligent man. He said worship comes from, it's an English kind of, compound or contraction, it means worth-ship. You worship one who's worthy to receive your praise. And only the Lord God of the Bible is worthy of that. Isaiah 2 verse 19 reads, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. The whole human race is involved when God shakes the earth and begins to punish the world for its sin of worshiping Satan directly. Or they worship him indirectly with idols and statues and various you know, saints and images of religious faiths. But they will be worshiping him directly. Visibly, here on the earth, they will be worshiping Satan in human form. God says in Isaiah 13, verse 11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I call this sermon today, Newsflash, dot, 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 this just in. And point number one today is this. God will punish those who worship Satan. You think he won't? You better believe he will. You better believe he will. Um, that verse we just read in Isaiah 13, 11, he said, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Uh, but the Lord also makes a great promise of hope to those who know Christ and who love his word uh, and are looking for him uh, Revelation 3, verse 10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. According to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, you and I are waiting to hear the voice of Christ echoing through the universe saying, Come up hither! We, um, John described himself as that disciple whom Jesus loved in about four places in his gospel, John the Apostle. And the Lord Jesus said, Christ, or, the, or Paul writes, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so when John says he heard a voice telling him, come up hither, we take that uh, as a great picture of the whole church being called up by the voice of Jesus Christ. We call that the rapture of the saints. The word rapture 
isn't in the Bible. That doesn't mean it's not true. The word Trinity is not in our Bible. That doesn't mean it's not true. Um, and so just because the word isn't in the vocabulary of our Bible, the definitions and the explanations are all throughout the scriptures. And we're looking for that uh, nevertheless to, to take place. Uh, in Revelation 4, verse 1, we read that heaven is opened and somebody goes up. That'll be the you, you and I. Later, in chapter 19, verse 11, heaven is said to open again, and at that time, someone comes down. At that time, it's Jesus Christ and the armies of heaven, of which you and I will be a part, following Jesus Christ. And clothed in fine linen, white and clean, on uh, an army of horses, uh, to come and wreak uh, havoc and bring judgment upon the world with Jesus Christ. The world is obsessed with certain things these days. And for several decades now, they've been obsessed with UFOs and flying saucers. And there's all these new age nuts, mystical nuts who think that they communicate with uh, these space beings, space aliens. And, uh, they may be spaced out, but they're not communicating with any space aliens. But what the world is getting ready for is an invasion from outer space. That's what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. An invading army from outer space. We, you and I are not going to come as their friendly space brothers uh, coming to restore peace and put an end to nuclear weapons like the Alka. No. We're coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ leading an army to just wipe out the world. Just wipe it out. And the Valley of Armageddon, where they all converge to try and withstand, they'll be able to... I, I fully expect that with, with the space uh, and satellite technology and detection systems, they'll be able to um, triangulate or project where Christ's army is going to set foot and descend and they'll see it coming and they'll gather the troops into the Valley of Megiddo and try to withstand that, that onslaught. And God just wipes them out and the blood runs up to the, the bridle of the horses and he just tramples right through their blood. Doesn't care at all. Why should he? But um, between Revelation chapters 4 and chapter 21, there's no mention of the word church at all found in that book. And the tribulation will commence at the sudden disappearance of God's saints, you and I, at the rapture of the saints. And uh, the church age will then be over. And that brings me to point number two, and God bringing, brings judgment. Point number two is, we won't be here. We won't be here. A new dispensation will then be in effect, and salvation will then be a, require some combination of faith, and works faith in Christ and keeping the commandments of God because it's primarily a time of Jacob's trouble Jeremiah 37 30 verse 7 said and so it's going to be primarily a time of testing for the Jew you know the, the Jew has been tested and tried and tried and tested repeatedly throughout his entire existence one army rises, rises up to try to wipe out the Jew that the Jew survives and the army is, is destroyed and disappears into obscurity. The Nazi party in World War II tried to do the same thing. The Nazi party disappeared, Adolf Hitler's dead, and that party's uh, le legally against the law to resurrect that party in Germany. But the Jew goes on. The Jew survives no matter what you throw at him. Because whether he knows it or not, God is preserving his race. God is preserving his people. I wish the Jew could grab a hold of that and realize it's the same God that Christians are looking forward to that is protecting the Jew. Not only does the Jewish race survive, Brother Lee and I have talked about this many times, the Jewish language, Hebrew, survives. They're speaking Old Testament Hebrew in Israel today, 2018. And I've used the illustration of what what nearly happened to the Korean language while well, Japan occupied Korea for 35 years. The Korean language almost disappeared. The Japanese forced Korean students to speak English, to speak Japanese and learn Japanese, and they tried to ban the speaking of Korean in, 
uh, Korean society. It only took 35 years and almost disappeared. Thankfully, it didn't. But, uh, but the Jew has been kicked from country to country and rejected and turned away. Oh, they're welcome Muslims all over the world, but they don't want Jews in a lot of places. They didn't want Jews when the Jews were trying to flee from the, the Nazi party. They didn't want them immigrating other, throughout the places. You know, this country wasn't too friendly to welcome Jews trying to get away from Adolf Hitler. But this country wasn't alone. Other countries said, so those people are too much trouble. We don't just, just don't let them come. Let them fend for themselves. That's not our problem. But God said, I will bless him that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So those countries that have decided to become friends of Israel, friends of the Jewish people, to defend the Jews' right to survive, to exist, those countries are, have been blessed by God. And uh, it's not enough to say we don't want Islam. You have to say we or we become a friend of Israel, too. I was reading, uh, uh, learning last night, reading some articles that Austria just had a recent election, elected a new government, and uh, the Austrian government, uh, yeah, like, like, they had two or three competing political parties in this uh, government for leadership, and the uh, two most conservative parties who say, we're sick and tired of the European Union forcing Muslim immigrants on us, changing our culture, changing the whole Christian, Christian identity, Christian symbolism of Europe, and uh, the new elected chancellor of Austria is only 31 years old. He says, we're going to shut down Islam. They've already closed down seven mosques, and they've, they've deported 40 imams. And, and the same thing's happening in Italy. I, th I was telling my wife that's not ironic that the Pope, whose Vatican sits right inside the city of Rome, Italy, is all for welcoming Muslims. We should be kind and welcome them. Yeah, he tells everybody else to welcome them, but, but he wouldn't want them invading any dominant, predominant Catholic countries. And the government, new government in Italy uh, says we're going to deport 500,000 Muslims out of this country. But it's not enough just to say we don't want Islam. You better become a friend of Israel. That's where the blessing will come. There's no blessing promised if you just say no to a corrupt, pagan, barbaric religion. You have to embrace the, the, the chosen race of God. That is the Jew. You and I won't be here. And salvation during that time will be some combination of faith in Christ and the commandments of Israel, or commandments of God to Israel. And I'll give you some verses to for that. We won't turn to them. Revelation 12, verse 11, 12, verse 17, 14, verse 12, and Revelation 20, verse 4. Now, coming to the aid of, of the Jew in his greatest time of persecution is what God will expect of those left behind after the rapture. Resisting the one world mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, maintaining both faith and in Christ and good works in your actions all the way through, even if it costs you your life. You say, you ask, well, how much faith and how much good works? And the answer is, I have no idea. Because I don't plan to be here to find out. But during the tribulation, the devil and his angels are said to be cast into the earth, Revelation 12, verse 9. And if you think he causes trouble now, Wait till he has no other sphere in which to operate except right here on the earth. And the, and the presence of believers uh, is then gone. Unclean spirits will gather men together at the Battle of Armageddon um, to try and withstand the incoming invasion of Jesus Christ and his armies of saints. Uh, they'll try to destroy Israel once and for all, Revelation 16 and verses 14 through 16. Isaiah said that men would go into the holes of the earth, rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. The Apostle John recorded the same things again in the book of Revelation. Turn quickly to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And we'll read three verses there. Verses 15, 16, and 17.
Revelation 6, beginning there at verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For, great, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The Bible says God will shorten the days in order to preserve men's lives. Matthew 24, verse 24 states, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those are, those, uh, those are the ones who refuse the mark of the beast and are trying to make it to the, survive to the end, except for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Revelation 18, or rather 8, verse 12, we read, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I think this has two applications. The daylight hours will be shortened, so that there, there won't be any light in which to see. And, the cover, and this will enable those trying to survive, and uh, he that uh, endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Those trying to endure and resist the man of sin will be able to move around and escape, go from one place to another under the cover of darkness. I think that's got to be part of the, the reason for that. But also, there will be some last minute catching up of saints at the near the end of the tribulation, just before the end, to escape the Antichrist. And this brings me to point number three. God has a big finish planned. God has a big finish planned. Not only is he getting ready to judge the world who worships Satan, not only are you and I not going to be here, but God has a big finish planned. Big crescendo at the end of the music. The Great Tribulation will end with the return of Jesus Christ out of heaven, Revelation 19, verse 11, with his glorified saints, Revelation 19, 14, Joel chapter 2, and other places. The Bible says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that's going to be. We sing, what a day that will be when my Savior I shall see. And we look forward to the day we die and go to be with him or we get raptured to go be with him. <clears throat> and that's what we sing about. But what a day it's going to be when the unbelieving world sees him as well. But they won't see him as the loving Savior in whom they trusted, who forgave their sins, whose blood washed their, their, the stain of their souls clean. They'll see him as the one, the, the last person they want to see in the universe. The judge of all creatures living uh, on the earth uh, will finally come to uh, set the record straight and to judge the wicked world who, who decided to worship Satan. You know, um, that can't happen unless the hearts of men are gradually conditioned to prefer evil over good. Once their hearts have been conditioned that way, they'll be, it'll be easy for them to embrace Satan. Brother Del Grande um, and I were, were texting each other early this morning. He sent me an article about uh, they, they have a statue with the Ten Commandments at the state capitol in, um, in uh, uh, Arkansas. What's the state capitol? Arkansas. Little Rock. Little Rock, Arkansas. They have a statue of the Ten Commandments. Uh, on the grounds at, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And a group of Satanists just unveiled an eight-foot statue of a goat-headed uh, demon with wings uh, and horns called Baphomet. And uh, they're, they're saying uh, equal rights. You should allow our statue on the Capitol grounds as well. And of course, the article uh, is just temporary. I said the, the, the statue is only going to be there temporary while they make their challenge in court that 
they should have their image portrayed there as well. Now, they say if you're not going to portray some symbol of all religions, then you shouldn't portray any. And uh, that might be where it goes. The state capitol, I'm, I'm guessing, might have to take down the Ten Commandments. Some liberal judge will rule you either take down the, the Ten Commandments or you have to put up a statue of a, of a demonic god as well. So you have people who are already professing worship in Satan. And they would rather worship Satan than the one who said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Honor thy father and thy, and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What is wrong with those rules? What could possibly be wrong with any of those commandments uh, to order society? But the, the Satanism, the, the books supposedly worshiping Satan, simply say, do whatever you want. There are no rules. You don't have to answer to anyone. Unless one of their own family members gets hurt or injured or murdered, then they're crying and screaming to the law for justice, right? Unbelievers are some of the biggest hypocrites in the world. And it gets right down to it. I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close right here. I'm, I'm glad that I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm glad that on November 5th, 1967, I was born again. I was saved and washed clean from my sins. And I could cry to God and say, forgive me. And I knew that he was doing so. And you know where it happened? I don't know if the camera will pick this up. It happened right there. That's right where I kneeled and prayed and asked God to save me. 51 years ago. 51 years, I've, or nearly, I've been saved, and I'm only 37 years old. I don't know how that happened, but it nevertheless happened. And uh, it's, it's the most vivid memory of my childhood, and I'm thankful that I know him. Uh, I've never doubted my salvation. I've been a sorry Christian, but I've never been sorry that I was one. And uh, I've doubted how God could love me, how God could keep giving me uh, chance after chance to, to do something for him when I've failed and stumbled so miserably so often and yet he does if you're alive and you're kicking you have a mind to think and reason with god wants to use you to do something for jesus sake before the rapture comes uh, pass out a track witness to somebody try to help someone understand uh, the word of god or help with their spiritual question help to answer their questions from the bible and uh, give them some measure of comfort because of the salvation you enjoy and the comfort that God has given you, God wants to give to them as well.